I've been really good at tactics, but the strategy has been wrong. And it doesn't matter how good you are at sales copy, email copy, and so on and so forth. If the big idea is wrong, then it's going to lead to frustration. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Perfectly Mentored. I'm your host, Jason Portnoy. My guest on this episode is Craig Ballantyne. He is known as the world's most disciplined man. He's built turbulence training fitness over 10 million sales and runs earlyrise.com. He's written three books, The Perfect Day Formula, The Perfect Week Formula, and Unstoppable, which is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. He's helped over 55,000 high performers own the day, double their income, and work less. Master of productivity. You're not going to want to miss this episode. Check it out. Craig, welcome to the show. Hey, this is going to be a lot of fun, Jason. Uh, look, I, for the people who, who may not be so aware of who you are, I, tell us a little bit about that journey, because I know you have a very interesting journey, like uh, personal trainer, anxiety, everything, and then become like the guru, the coach for, for, for entrepreneurship. How, how do you make that transition? What's that journey like? Well, man, I, you know, I still grew up in Canada. I wanted to be a hockey player, realized that wasn't going to happen. Grew up on a farm and don't say uh, Leafs, so don't I, say Leafs though. No, I just wanted to be a hockey player, man. Okay, and, fair. And, okay, uh, good. I, you know, it doesn't matter Montreal Canadians, whoever, but you, you know, I realized that that dream was not going to happen. And so then I thought, okay, well, you know, I'll go to college college and you know become a strength and conditioning coach in the national hockey league you know that was my ticket to success and i remember um one of my mentors told me like yeah the michigan strength uh, michigan state strength coach makes a hundred grand in a year and i was like whoa man hundred grand a year that's insane and so i was always kind of like a coach and trainer at heart and you know giving feedback and and getting coached and taking feedback too and then all of a sudden I realized, you know, a, a great coach in, in the aspect I was going after, like a strength and conditioning coach has to have this high energy all the time. It has to be, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I got drained by training sessions. And so I was fortunate that the internet kind of got birthed when I was in college and I started a website and I started selling stuff. I sold my first program online, my first workout program online on January 28th, 2001. I sold a word document through PayPal for 60 bucks. And it was like, one of the greatest days of my life. And so I went on to, went on to uh, write for Men's Health Magazine and build this fitness program. But so many people just asked me, Jason, they're like, how did you do this? What'd you do? And so I started um, my first business seminar in 2007. And I did that for online, not online, but for uh, personal trainers only. And then I just started getting this reputation for being really productive, even more so than building an online business. I'm not like the world's greatest at that. And so I just started showing people how to do that and then eventually wrote my books. And also, you know, before that, the reason why I got productive was because I had my anxiety attacks right when I was making the transition from personal trainer to online business. So we can dive deep into that because, you know, I've rode the roller coaster of life pretty good. Yeah, no, I'd love to dive deep in that because I think, I think that's a struggle that a lot of entrepreneurs are having, um, you know, that I, I speak to a lot of different entrepreneurs. And anxiety is a big issue and, and something that's not talked about enough. So I appreciate you coming straight out with it and talking about it. How do you overcome that? What, what advice do you have for the listeners listening in regarding that? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, like my, I feel like my problems were self-induced. So, you know, nobody should shed a, a tear for me. And when I was going through the anxiety at the time, it was brutal. It was crippling. It was paralyzing. But today I can look back and like almost laugh at that time in, in my life, you know, even though it's like truly the lowest point in my life, I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to embarrass my family, all this sort of stuff uh, because of the physical symptoms of anxiety, which, you know, are manifest like a manifestation of the, the mental and emotional problems. And so it was the lowest point in my life, but I look back on it. Uh, fondly now because I'm able to help people get through it. So if somebody out there is even at a one out of 10 of anxiety, which means like you're stressed at the end of the day, or if you're a 10 out of 10 of anxiety, which means like you're like I did, I went to the emergency room twice, or you're going to see your doctor as you should, if it's serious, you know, start there is understand that you can get through it. Okay. And then, so I built, I would say I probably have like 25 tools in my toolbox, Jason. So if I ever get stressed out, I actually over caffeinated today. And so I do feel like a little, edgy, anxious, but I know, I know what it is and I know how to reduce it and I know how to deal with it. So, you know, I could actually double my caffeine intake and have all the problems in the world dumped on me in one day and I'll never have an anxiety attack again. And so again, that's to give hope to people out there. So the first thing to do is what I did not do today, which is remove all of the offending 
um, you know, nutrition substances and alcohol and all that sort of stuff from your, your life, all the stimulants that will cause you anxiety. So you obviously have to do a bit of self-reflection, introspection, and figure out what the heck does put me in an anxious state and then remove them as much as possible. And then it's helpful to be exercising regular and eating well, but understand I look like a men's health magazine, fitness model cover, uh, cover model when I had my, um, anxiety attacks and went to the emergency room. So I walked into the emergency room when I was about 29 years old. And again, I, you know, I was wearing a shirt because it was Toronto on uh, January 1st. So I was clearly wearing a coat and a shirt, but I could have walked in there with shirt off. It would have been six pack abs and I still could have had the anxiety. So simply being exercising and that type of stuff, it, it helps, but it's not a cure-all. And I actually was very introverted when I was younger uh, had introverted tendencies is what I like to say. I don't like to label myself as an introvert. I don't think that's helpful to me. And so I had, I have introverted tendencies and that meant that I kept everything up in my head and my, my anxiety engine was revving. My wheels were spinning. My mind was racing all the time with all the thoughts in my head. So I didn't have outlets. So today I have outlets of podcasts. I have outlets of the books that I write. I have outlets of journaling. I have outlets of meditation. I have outlets to get all these thoughts out of my head or at least like understand them better, but I didn't have those things back then. And so removing the negatives and adding some outlets are probably the most important things that people can do. But I like to use this little visual analogy about how important it is to remove negatives. And it's not just about anxiety. It's about, you know, productivity. It's about your business. It's about your fitness, removing the negatives removing the things, the, the toxic temptations, the distractions, removing is far more effective than adding stuff in. And so like, cause if you think about this, if you have two people running a marathon, like let's say you and I are running a marathon, everything else being equal, we would run around three hours. If I gave you the fastest shoes in the world and I put a hundred pound log on my back, which one is going to have the greatest impact on the marathon performance. Like, yeah, you might shave a minute or two, or two off by adding the shoes, but by having the negative weigh me down, I'm gonna be out there for 30 days with a hundred pound log on my back. So, you know, if I shed that log, that's gonna make the biggest difference. So just think about that, everybody, whatever it is in life, and it doesn't just apply to anxiety, but whatever the negatives, the chains that are on you, removing those should be your first step through self-reflection and introspection, you figure out what they are, you remove them. And all of a sudden, every aspect of your life is going to get better. That's awesome. I, you know, one, one of the things that listening to you talk, you gave a lot of awesome tools right there. What I see with entrepreneurs is when they get tools, they all say, that sounds great. But then they don't do anything about it. It's almost like the like motivation, right? People like to feel motivated, but they don't like doing anything about it. I know you're also... Um, a big believer in execution and, and taking action and that you have your methods of making sure people actually do take action. Let's talk about that because I think that's the perfect follow-up to what you're saying. Okay, we have the tools now. How do you force people to take action? It's a great question. And I remember a specific email that I got from a, a good friend of mine. He was, um, I went to university with him. He's a doctor. He's really smart, but like everybody in life, he got overwhelmed. And he sent me this email about this overwhelming situation that he was in. And when, when it's not your problem, you're really good at solving uh, problems, you know, because I wasn't emotionally attached, like, like as a coach, as a coach, really right. It's, it's, it's the coach. It's yeah. the coach's role. Right. I'm, I'm not emotionally attached to the problem, but everybody who has a problem is emotionally attached to it. Like even I have problems and I'm emotionally attached to them, which is why it's harder for me to solve them. So anyways, I look at my friend's problems with unemotional, unattached eyes and I say, well, the solution to me is clear. Here's what you need to do. And here's the, and then I said, what's the first step that you can take to fixing this and executing? Because you go back and you say, like, everybody likes to get motivated. And then when, you know, so whether it's like, hey, you know, we've got to go and build an app or we've got to go and build a sales page or we've got to build out a sales team. Like, okay, I can understand that rationally. But when you look at that, that is such an overwhelming project and you, and you can get paralyzed by it, right? Paralysis through analysis or whatever it is. And so I just say, well, what's the first step that you can take? So when I, when I actually do like, I'm a, like I just had a mastermind down here in Cancun, we always do this 90 day planning and it's like, okay, for your next 90 days, what's your major outcome goal, your numbers-based goal. And then what are the three process goals underneath that, that 
the action steps that you control that will move you ahead. And that's good. But again, those three process goals might seem massive. And then the next question is, before you leave this meeting room, what's one thing that you can do that moves you ahead? Because mm -hmm. it's just like the cliche, Jason, how do you eat, eat an, uh, an elephant? Well, you eat an elephant one bite one at a time. time. So you got to take that first bite, right? So when you do something, so whether it's, you know, somebody's listening to this and they want to lose 10 pounds or they want to run a 10K or they want to start a business or they want to, you know, do this major project in their business, you have, there's one thing you have to do first. Like you have to do something to get started. And so when we do that, when we take an action, it gives us momentum because it's like, you know, these, these things here, the phones, the curses, when the red light notifies us, we get a dopamine hit, but it's similar when you take an action towards your big goals, you take an action, you get a, a flood of, you know, your good positive neurotransmitters, you feel good because you acted. So now you have momentum, which gives you motivation. You then turn that motivation into more momentum and you keep on going and going, and going. Another visual for this is when most people see that big project, like I got to go and build a sales team of 10 people. What they see is like, I believe it was Sisyphus from Greek mythology. He has to roll the, the rock up the hill every single day. He has to roll this giant rock up the hill. And that's what it is. Like, I got to roll this rock up the hill. And then it rolls back down on top and he has to roll it back up every single day when it's a big project. But when we flip it and go, what's the one thing you can do right now? And then the next question I ask people is, what's the one major action you can take in 24 hours? And what's the one major action you can take in 48 hours? And then what's the one major action you can take in 72? And then what's the one major action you can do this week? And so on and so forth. And, and who do you need to help you? And who does what by when? And who is your accountability to hold uh, accountability coach or partner to hold you to this? Who are all these things? And we have all this information. It becomes very clear. And now we switch from being Sisyphus rolling the um, rock up the hill to being, I don't know, I don't have a name for it. maybe Craig uh, rolling a snowball down the hill. And when you roll a snowball down the hill, what happens? You're from Montreal, you know, you know, you get the snowball, it's about this big. And all of a sudden you roll it, it's this big, and this big and momentum and momentum. And all of a sudden, this project, this eating of the elephant becomes so much easier. And now, man, we're so far ahead. So it's figuring out those first steps and then the subsequent steps, which gives us dopamine hit, which gives us momentum, which gives us a motivation to come back and do it again. And I, I like your take on it because I think a lot of people look at it and sit there and say, all right, maybe you set a goal that's too big. And I actually don't think that's the reason entrepreneurs fail is because set goals too big. I actually think they probably set goals that are too small and they hit it way too early and then they, they just stay comfortable. Um, you and then they bounce them. to some other shiny object. It, 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 yeah. So I, I actually don't think it's, it's big, it's big enough goals, but you and I both work with a lot of entrepreneurs. It's become a space that's been highly glamorized. People all want to be raw, uh, like entrepreneurs. Problem is nine out of 10 businesses fail. And that's something that's not talked about enough. It's not talked about uh, that entrepreneurship's a lonely journey that that's not talked about enough as well, that the suicide rate's pretty high in it, but I don't even want to go down th that dark path. I want to talk about why do you think so many business or most entrepreneurs fail? I, I mean, I have my ideas of why I think they fail, but I'd love to hear what you think. Well, the politically incorrect reason, is, uh, one of the politically incorrect reasons is that they have bad ideas. Mm -hmm. And so you can take somebody who's willing to work 12 hours a day, which is kind of what it takes at the start for a lot of businesses. You can take somebody who's smart, willing to work a lot, um, could even be a great leader. But if they're in a bad business because they have a bad idea or they just have an idea that's maybe in an industry that's going downhill. Like you're, you're taking all of this energy and you're, it's almost like throwing good money after bad. And if you simply take that person, like I, I've had a, um, not just clients, but a lot of friends who I look at them and I go, your skill set, like you've gone to all these seminars over the years, you've built amazing sales training and you've built this, that, and the other thing. And yet you're running a, a, a gym and, and running a gym is great, but, but, you know, cause I own, I own a couple and all that sort of stuff. And it's, it's a great impact, but they're, they're taking like a level 10 entrepreneur skill set and applying it to a level one problem, or they're in, like I said, a bad idea, like a bad idea of a bad business. Like you can't fix, you, it doesn't matter how smart you get or how good you get at sales. You've just chosen a bad idea. And so I think people might rush into that a little bit too much. And so I think it's worthwhile 
for everybody all the time, just go, are we, are we fighting an insurmountable battle because of we haven't done enough long-term thinking or big thinking and we're just going in there and we, and I've even done this myself. I've been really good at tactics, but the strategy has been wrong. And it doesn't matter how good you are at sales copy, email copy, and so on and so forth. If the big idea is wrong, then it's going to lead to frustration. So that's one of the many reasons. Um, but I, I don't see a lot of people calling out entrepreneurs for just simply having a bad idea. I, I say it all the time. It's if, if, if your product, fail, your product or service has to be good. Like before we even get into anything, right? I, anytime I speak on stage or do anything, I say, all this works, but we're going to make one assumption is that you have a good product or service, right? People actually want right. what you have. Um, so people pay you a lot of money to work with you. How do you tell them like straight up that your idea is bad? Well, if somebody's going to work with me, they don't have a bad idea because they're, they're usually qualified, you know, down the path. Yeah. Now that said, within a business, there will be bad ideas. So, you know, and this could be around people or this could be around, um, you know, product line or something. And so it's just, it's with the, it's getting them to see the problem in the way that we described it before with the unem unemotional, unattached eyes. Because as soon as somebody comes, like labels the idea theirs, right? Or, you know, I'm doing this, or I'm already a little bit down this path. They're very emotionally attached to it, hmm. right? It's just like everybody knows somebody who's it's been a, in a bad It's a business. It's the business is my baby uh, thought. Yeah, yeah, and and it's you know the analogy I was going to use is everybody has had a friend who's dating somebody that everybody else around goes, "Wow, this is just going to blow up and it's going <laughs> to be bad news," but they can't see it. You know, yeah. um, they don't want to see it and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> there are certain things that you can't force on somebody, you know, cause so I, I grew up, um, you know, it was probably contributed to my anxiety, but I grew up the son of an alcoholic and it doesn't matter how many times anybody tried to, uh, you know, tell my father to stop drinking. He was an alcoholic. He, he could only stop drinking when he was ready to stop drinking. He was never ready to stop drinking. So killed him. And it's the same with certain ideas. So if I find somebody who's not willing to be coachable, not willing to take that feedback and not willing to look at things with outside eyes, it's going to be a real frustrating thing. So there will be certain people where it's like, okay, listen, this is not a good fit. You need to go over here and, and deal with somebody else, or you need to go and you know, sometimes get therapy. Uh, this is just outside my scope of expertise. But when it is somebody who's like, Craig, listen, I want your advice and they're open to it. Then I say, okay, listen, you know, I either try and use an analogy. I try and use another system. I say, I try and show them like, okay, this is probably what's going to happen. Or what do you think is going to happen if we do this? And you try and get them to see, to, for them to come up with a solution, for them to see the change as their own idea. Because when it's, you know, people have always say like, people don't like change. Well, people like change when it's a benefit to them. And people don't like change when it's not a benefit to them. So if, if somebody, if an entrepreneur has an idea and I'm trying to get them to change, and if the idea of change means like it's a knock on their ego and it means a lot of work to change direction, it's going to be very difficult to get that person to agree with me that it's time to change. But if we can get them to almost be a part of figuring out what the next step is and how we can transition this and why we need to transition it, and all of a sudden they see like, oh, there's, there's a lot of benefit to me to making the transition and the change then I have somebody a whole lot more bought in. And worst case scenario is then I might, you know, I bring in another coach from my team and we have like a more of a group meeting or we get involved with their team and try and get their feedback um, so that it's not just me uh, overcoming that, that insurmountable uh, decision-making. One of the things I'm, I'm going to feed this to you perfectly because of what you do. I actually think one of the biggest reasons most businesses fail is because they try to go at it alone and they don't ask for help. I would not be where I am, where I'm at if I didn't have amazing mentors, hired coaches, done the right things. I see the value in it. But I think one of the hardest things to sell is coaching for them to see that they need to ask for help, right? Everything I've ever had, I, I have is because I asked for it. I, I find it so easy. How'd you get, how'd you get Craig on the podcast? I asked him. Is that easy? Well, yeah, I mean, he has to say yes, but I asked, right? It starts with an ask. How do you get people to see the value in coaching aside from that? It's helped you. I know it's helped you. I know it's helped me, but what's your advice for people listening right now when it comes to like, Hey, if you've been holding back on coach, you got to pull the trigger. 
Yeah. So I, I just use so many of my stories. I use examples of, of my clients, but I, I can also use this in an example that everybody can get where it's not business related and just show you how powerful it is. Because one of my phrases, Jason, is that everything in life is easier the more people you know. Hmm. So this goes back to what you said about doing everything on your own. If you do everything on your own and you don't ask for help, it's going to be very difficult. You know, first of all, it's going to be very difficult to come up with the strategies and tactics, but it's also going to be very difficult for you on the tough days. And I always say like, there's, there's literally going to be a day in your life when you're, you know, your spouse or your boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, is ready to leave you. Your dog has run away and somebody like punches you in the stomach and you're going to have to show up and be your best in your business on that day. So it's very difficult to do that if you don't have support. Now, on the flip side, or the, uh, the more practical side, or the, uh, the non-business side, the story is just an example of how easy life becomes when you know more people and you can ask for help. So 2019, I was single. I didn't want to be single. I wanted to find an amazing woman. I wanted to get married. I want to have kids. And so I did something that is really um, a key component of what I believe a, a uh, principle of success, which is I got public accountability. I had shared it in my book, The Perfect Day Formula. Um, and then I shared it on stage at an event that I did. And I said, you know, I want to go and do this. Here's my exact plan. And I built out one of those 90 day plans for finding the love of my life. And one of the things, one of the key process uh, goals, the action steps was to ask my three most popular female friends for introductions. Cause I, I, I was fortunate because through all my coaching, I had met all these, these uh, female entrepreneurs who knew a lot of other women who were really smart and beautiful and, and great and pr uh, proactive and high achieving. And I asked them for introductions. And long story short, one of them introduced me to the woman who became my wife. And I actually, you know, so that was like November of nine, uh, 2019. And, you know, it, it was like less than 90 days. I achieved that goal faster than 90 days because I reached out for help. Now I had been doing it all on my own. You know, it's my big ego, like, oh yeah, I can do this on my own. And, you know, I don't need help. I don't need to ask, you know, free introductions for so long. And when I finally went and did it, solved the problem like that. So just think about what that can do for your business when you go and find somebody who's got the answers just sitting there, usually someone who's been there and done that, achieved what you want to achieve, who shares your morals and ethics, who has plenty of references, who has good rapport with you. Like, how could that person not have a huge impact on your life? And because, you know, the funny thing is, is I'm one of those people that you and I are talking to right now. I could have hired a business coach in 2003 but I was so cheap, so stubborn, so egotistical that I waited three years. And when I hired my first business coach, like he set in place this, um, he asked me this question. He said, in five years from now, what do you want your business to look like? And I, and that was the very first question on the very first coaching call. And I said, I want to have a business like this website, early to rise.com, which is a health, wealth, and success newsletter. And he said, great, I know that uh, website, but you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to improve your speaking, improve your writing, improve your network, improve this, improve that. I was like, okay. But I ended up just to keep a long story short. I bought that business, the exact business, five years, three months, and 17 days after that first call, because I told my coach what I wanted. He told me what to do and he held me accountable to it. And I was like, then I wrote the perfect day formula and the, the vision that I put in that book that I then got public accountability from, you know, all my friends who were my coaches through it. I, I achieved that goal in six years, you know, one year, a little bit short or a little bit too late. But I mean, that's just the power of asking for help in both the personal and professional world. Couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm, I'll, I want, I want to talk about this because I know you're a big believer in this and we'll, we'll start wrapping up, but working more myth, right? I, I know you're, you're, you're not the guy that's sitting there saying, go hustle 24 seven. That's not you. Um, which is interesting because if you look at a lot of other gurus in this space, for example, call them gurus, you managed to stay out of a lot of like the negative, like, like who is a scammer? Who is this guy? Which is a whole different question. Like, how do you, how do you do that? That's, that's pretty. Well, I mean, I've been here since the internet started. I, I, so, I mean, if pretty, I've been here that long. I'm Gary Vaynerchuk okay. gets called a scammer. So, I mean, like, like, so, so I, the fact that you don't have, you know, you know, when there's actually, there's actually hate sites uh, devoted to mother Teresa. Really? Yeah. So mother so, Teresa is getting hate, but you're not, this is the, so that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's what I'm trying to point out here. So, so something's good here about you, but, um, 
but the working the working hard the working harder myth versus the working smarter myth like let's 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 chat about that for a second well listen so i think that anybody out there who has had a kid you know I've, we just had our first child and congratulations yeah thank you thank you and so so it can do one to somebody it can throw you into complete chaos or it can make you even productive because it puts even harder boundaries on what you do and forces you to say no even more to the things that you kind of sort of want to do, but you don't have time. And I always turn to like Oprah for this. Like I call her Nopra because who in the world says no more than Oprah? Like she has a billion plus followers. Like there's a billion women in, in this, on this planet who would love five minutes with Oprah. Now, if she said yes to all those people, she would say no to the, to the massive things that reach billions of people. You know, so she worked one-on-one -on -one with a billion people. She'd never be able to do it. But if she does one massive thing, she can impact billions of people in a positive way. So when you say no and you focus on what really matters, you can actually have more impact than working more. And so it's really about boundaries. It's about prioritizing. It's about clarity about what you want. It's about the automation, delegation, uh, elimination, and communication, about putting those factors into play. And it's about blocking and batching your time and not losing it to death by a thousand cuts. Like today for me, it's podcast, podcast, video, podcast, call. And then I have a, um, I hired somebody this afternoon for a meditation training, you know, so they're coaching me. So it's back to back to back to back to back. And when I used to do podcasts, like I've done, done over 600 shows now, I used to have one podcast scheduled in the afternoon. And then I realized that that one hour podcast was actually two hours because an hour before my introverted tendencies would take over and I'd start thinking about it half an hour before I'm like, ah, I, I can't even focus. I may as well just shut down, you know, get the microphone set up. And then after the podcast it takes me 15 minutes, to get back into the thing. So it's death by a thousand cuts. Mm. But when you have a kid or when you want to work less and you want to actually get more done, you realize, Oh, I have to plan these things back to back to back to back. And I have to cut them off shorter and I can get more stuff done in a small amount of time. And then one other thing is I, uh, I call it making sure that you match the, the intensity of the activity with the intensity of your brain power. So most people, what they do, they go through life trying to take a square peg and jam it into a, a round hole by doing a hard activity when they're tired. Now, what if you identify the time of day when you're three times more creative, productive, and energetic, I call that magic time, square hole, and then you took the square peg of your toughest activity, jammed it in, perfect fit, you triple your productivity, even if you don't cut your work hours. So it's simply thinking better. So it's working better, uh, working smarter, but not working more. And that's, you know, those are just a few of the things and I can rant and rave about that all day long because I love to help people with it. I love that. And, and one of the smartest things that I've learned from my mentor is just structure your day and be very, very strict on how you structure your day and plan it. Because when I first hired my first coach and he looked at my calendar, he said, no wonder you're having problems in, in certain areas. He's like, your calendar is a mess. Like, let's clean this all up. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll let you go with this one question. The drunk farmer, <laughs> right? I, 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 I got to ask, I got to ask, what's this killer morning routine? The drunk farmer was my father. And so I grew up on a farm and every single morning, no matter how much he drank the day before, he was up and he went immediately when he got up, he didn't have breakfast. He didn't do anything. He went and fed the cows. And so I was like, oh, if you got to do something important, you get up and you do it. As Mark Twain said, if your job is to eat a frog, best thing to do is eat the, that frog first thing in the morning. If your job is to eat two frogs, best thing to do is eat the biggest frog first. Because what most people do is they wake up, they have a morning routine, maybe they work out, maybe they do a bunch of stuff. They know there's that thing on the calendar that has to get done today and they push it off and they push it off and they push it off and they push it off. And, push it off. and you know, they have that mismatch. They're tired later on in the day and trying to do the thing and it takes them three times as long and it's you know, half the quality. If you got up and most people, according to research uh, in Daniel Pink's book, when we have the greatest discipline, willpower and intention first thing in the morning. 
So if you get up and you're doing even your to-do list first thing in the morning, you're already too late. You got to get up and you have, you know, your to-do list should have been done the day before. You should have planned and prepared and even done a bit of what I call process planning to make the path to success even smoother and let your subconscious mind work on the project or problem overnight. And then you wake up in the morning and as soon as you can, you know, maybe you have to take the kids to school or whatever, um, or maybe you can work first thing in the morning as I do. Like, like I'm working within seven minutes of getting out of bed. Because that's when I have the greatest discipline, willpower, and intention. I have planning, the preparation, my subconscious mind worked on the problem overnight, and the work flows out of me. And that's what I learned from my father, who was a, a, a big beer drinker, but also a relatively successful farmer because he got the work done first thing. But you're not a 5 a.m. riser, right? I, 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 know, I know that there's that whole myth of like, those successful people, they wake at their early risers. I will tell you this, that it's not about the hour that you get up. It's about what you do with the hours that you are up. Now, some days I'm up before 5 a.m. Some days I'm not. I don't actually use an alarm uh, anymore. But I also have a friend who built a $100 million supplement company between the hours of 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. Hmm. And it's simply all about the fundamentals. When you start your work block, work on the hardest thing first. And it doesn't matter what time of day that you start. That's the most important thing work in blocks and batches. And, you know, then you have to make sure you, you have all this communication and, and again, automate, delegate and eliminate everything that you shouldn't be doing and so on and so forth. But again, it's not about the hour that you get up. It's about what you do with the hours that you are up. Love it, Craig. Thank you so much for doing this. If people listening want to reach out. They realize they want to coach and they need to get better with productivity. They, they want to, they're interested in what you have to say. How can they reach out to you? Hit me up on Instagram at real Craig Ballantyne or, and uh, also like I wrote my books, I wrote three books. So, and I wrote them for my books to be read. So if you go to craigvalentine.com forward slash free books, you can download the eBooks and audio books for free. No opt-in required. Like I just want these books out there and unstoppable. My second book is all about how I overcame anxiety. Love it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. No problem, brother. Hey everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want, check out our most recent video over here. And this one is the one YouTube thinks you'll like. But if you really enjoyed watching, please do me a favor, like and subscribe over here. Thank you so much.